So welcome to this session, Dojo session, taking Agile and DevOps to the next level by Jefferson D'Souza and Vitesh Hikre. We are glad they can join us today. So without further delay, over to you, Jefferson. Hi, hello everyone. Uh, myself, uh, Vijay Thigde, and I'm the DevOps practice lead in Accenture. And I have Jefferson on the call. He is the overall Agile practice lead in Accenture, and also he leads the whole living systems uh, in Accenture. Jeff, if you can move on to the next slide. Okay, uh, the today's uh, topic about is uh, the whole dojo ways of working, why this uh, paradigm shift is required in Agile and DevOps. If you look at the whole industry report, right, as you know that uh, Agile and DevOps is there for last many years. And if you look at the latest industry report, both for Agile and DevOps, right, Agile, if you see that there is the adoption is there across everywhere. And but if you look at the whole maturity of this uh, adoption, right, which is uh, in case of in Agile, it is almost like 16% today. And DevOps uh, have taken that re report from the recent uh, DORA report where uh, uh, the whole the allied performance has increased from 20 to 26%. So, but there is a long way, long, uh, there is a big gap and a lot of organization has to catch up on this. And, uh, but uh, to, there is a, if you look at that, uh, there is a big gap is there who are like uh, still at the lower maturity or they are at the medium or at the higher level of maturity. So it is very important for every organization for them to move to the next level to get the more, say for example, if it is they want to achieve like uh, more 360 degree value from this agile and DevOps, there is a lot of things need to be done in the coming days. So the focus should be there on one is on building this whole capability in the full stack engineering that is building this full stack atomic feature teams. And also there is a continuous focus should be there on continuous learning and innovation. And the next is on the cloud. So it is continued to be a differentiator and it will be continued there for many more years. And finally, the focus should be there on the whole resiliency, how we can build this whole site reliability engineering team to make sure that we provide this 100% uptime for all the applications what we deliver. So how can we do this? Like, how can we achieve this, the whole paradigm shift, right? What I'm talking about for both Agile and DevOps. So let me give a quick example of how we are doing it, what we know about DevOps today. So what is the perception there in the market today? Like, uh, you know about DevOps, <clears throat> the perception there with the DevOps today is, Everybody knows about DevOps by continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous monitoring, and the whole automated infrastructure. That is the infrastructure as a code. That is what we know today about DevOps. But if you look at the way it is evolved from last couple of years, the focus has moved from the traditional CI, CD for custom. It has moved to focus. Now the focus is more on the cloud, DevSecOps, the data science, machine learning, AI, and all about this new ways of working. There are new tools in the market and the whole platform, what we talk about for the DevOps is gaining a lot, lot of momentum. And we talk about many tools in the past for the CI CD pipeline. Today, what you see here is that entire thing is now provided by one single tool like the GitHub, GitLab or the GitHub, and even for the cloud-based Jenkins. Or even in the discussion happening in the tooling also, that is the traditional way of like, where the engineer should know about only Jira, Jenkins, Confluence, or uh, Maven. But today it is something which is, they should know everything. Like along with that, they should know Docker, Kubernetes, IAC, and monitoring tools, and even a lot of this event-based architecture or the Prometheus. There are many things actually. And as I said, told you about, it has to be more for building it. It is very important to build this full stack capabilities. And also the whole ways of working also has changed like traditional, like uh, more of a reactive support to more into the site reliability engineering, the safe, and also bringing this whole lean governance. Before moving on to the next slide, why I'm telling about all these things, right? Because today now the most of our customers are today moving from uh, their, the, the complexity, say, of complexity have changed. And also if you look at with the, with the coming with the pandemic also, the whole ways of working has changed, right? 
So let me give an example how we have addressed one of these uh, challenges for one of the large telecom client in North America, where this is for their uh, uh, the e-commerce platform. At any point of time, they had like more than 25,000 users on their e-commerce platform. So if you look at their whole landscape, they had like th thousands of releases they are doing on weekly basis and everything either they have this entire infrastructure right? some of them are in their on premises some of them are on cloud and the complexity like they have to do this hundreds and thousands of releases so the thing is the, one of the challenge which they have faced here is the skill to deliver these changes on 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 demand release basis so one of the things which we have addressed here is through the what we have brought in here is the whole dojo concept right you know about the whole dojo so it is more about this immersive learning so what we have done is we have brought in this whole dojo based learning experience for the entire team here to deliver faster and with the predictable releases so this is something we have achieved through because their compl application complexity and also the whole infrastructure complexity and the skill required for many of their engineers like bringing in this whole full stack feature teams. So it is very important for them to take them through some of this immersive learning experience so that to immersive learning experience based on this whole hyper sprint because we talk about this whole hyper sprint based learning where along with their delivery, they used to spend like at least the two, two and a half hours every day based on their use cases, which is very much related to their project. So we'll talk about that, how we have achieved and based on this experience, what we have done here is like, uh, we created this, okay, well, then we started thinking about how we can scale this, how we can industrialize this, right? And how can we try this for across all the project? Say, for example, when I'm talking about and developing any application, rather than doing this more of a feature based, how can I split this vertically and bringing this whole hyper sprint based delivery, right? and delivering this everything through this uh, minimum viable product right so in next i will hand it over to jeff we'll talk about how we have achieved this how we have industrialized this and how we are going to address this like more of this full stack engineering feature teams from the traditional i shaped or t shaped skill to the e shaped skills for the future thanks Vijay. so um, as we talked about uh, that you know we really wanted uh, to really address some of the challenges that the our telco customer are facing. And that's where our first experiment was applying a dojo approach. So we said, okay, we start with, you know, dojo is all about, um, let's do hyper sprints. Let's have two sprints in a week, right? Let's go with a dojo for two, uh, about four weeks. And, and this is where we started within the expectation is that end of every sprint, which is two and a half days in a week, we'll have a sprint demo, right? And then we'll have the MVP. Um, we, we just, Talk to the team and say, okay, this is what we're going to try, right? Just to address some of the challenges they had in terms of learning, in terms of agility, in terms of you know, um, busting some of those impediments ahead. Right? Now, having said that, what did we learn? Um, and uh, to be honest, um, from our first experience itself, uh, we failed, and it was quite quite obvious that we failed. And um, and in some of the retrospective session, when we spoke to the team, one of the things is the team felt burnt out. Right? Because delivering working software in every two and a half days is absolutely a lot more strenuous than compared to two weeks. Right? The product owners, they were not happy that you know every sprint, the team would definitely not be able to deliver what they really want. Right? Um, the learning from the team, Dojo is meant to be immersive experience. The learning went for a toss. They're all focused on delivering what the end uh, sprint was all, all about. Right? The fourth important learning was the, with the team sense. Right, um, you know, with two and a half days of collaboration with a large team, it couldn't really work out. Right, so those were some of the key learnings we had, um, which is where our first experiment. While some people call it success, I would, as a coach, I would probably say it's probably not there. Right, or maybe it failed. Right? So what do you do? Uh, there definitely had to be things which we had to do to make it work. And we came up and we kind of modified this whole dojo approach as a three-hour approach. We said there are fundamental things you need to do differently. And you know, we, we call this as the first thing was about the realigned scope, right? This is where we first said it's not that dojo within the dojo framework, you have to deliver two two week sprints in two and a half days. It's not that right? we had to look at 
how do I really size the stories well so that you know stories can be delivered is as many ways in a vertical possible, right? And that's where stories were then uh, sized and shaped up based on sad scenarios, happy scenarios, or uh, ex exception scenarios, quality scenarios, constraint scenarios. Those were the different scenarios where each of these user stories was then further split up, and those um, uh, scenarios that were then assigned to you know to the based on the priority, based on the business priority, based on the technical uh, dependencies, they were then assigned to those sprints. Right? So th that's one big change we did, and as a part of that change, you know, what we also did is we kind of strengthened the squad envisioning uh, areas as well because. Initially, when we went into Dojo, we said, okay, we have the stories in place. Let's move on and st let's start with uh, you know, implementing Dojo. Right? But we said, okay, now with this, because of the whole scope issue, can we rethink about how we structure the whole squad envisioning area, right? Where you know we have uh, the right people in it, we have the right tools in it, we have the right uh, capabilities in it to really think about splitting the stories up. So and and also the process as well, just to make sure that you know, at any given point of time we have good amount of stories who are uh, which are refined well and which fit into those small criteria. Which are um, so and the other focus also was on the MVP, right? Saying that every two and a half, uh, every four weeks, right? Rather than thinking that every sprint will deliver some MVP, right? Uh, we felt that okay, how iteratively, incrementally it can be built, and that's where at the end of every sprint. Uh, sorry, at of every dojo, which is about four weeks, what is the MVP we are looking at, right? So that's why the whole focus went around a lot of changes as a part of the whole envisioning process and also the way we defined our granular stories, if I will. Okay. The second part, an important part, was about the realignment of the team. Um, you know, earlier we had about 12 people in a team, right? So that's why 12 people was definitely a lot more than what we could take, right? And we said, okay. You know, we need to have smaller squads, right? And that's where uh, we went with five or less. Five was the max. Um, ideally, we said about three or four people working in one dojo team. Um, but he said five is max because some teams have said we can't do three, you know, we really have to deliver something. Um, and to end, we need really five people. So I said, okay, for the time being, let's start with five people, right? So that's why we had smaller squads, um, you know, along with it. We also then repurpose some of the uh, processes as well within the you know within the sprints as well. So we kind of kept it fluid for each of the teams to say, okay, when they want to do standouts, when they want to do a uh, you know a sprint demo, when they want to do a retrospective, right? Some of these things and how they want to conduct it as well. At the end of the day, it's all about agility. Right? So that's the second part. The third part and a very important part, you know, was about the thinking itself, right? Um, and that's where. Um, it's, dojo is not just about hyperspeed, right? It's about immersive learning. It's about um, you know busting your impediments much faster, right? And that's where what we said is we kind of get that uh, learning behavior within the team. Um, initially, we started said as a part of your sprint backlog, ten percent of your time is going to be spent on learning. Um, and in some teams, we also saw fifteen percent of their time of the sprint time was meant on learning. End of the sprint. In the sprint demo, while the functional demo was going on, right, they would also demo um, what they have learned as a part of the sprints, and this was aligned to their product backlog as well, right? In terms of what is the learning required for the future uh, to really build the future uh, part of the backlog. Right? So all this all you know, kind of got into thinking where uh, not just the team but also the business also got involved in just thinking and you know reshaping the way the teams really work. Right. So those are the fundamental things which you really have to bring in um, to really make the dojo thing more experiential and make really work. Right? Now, having said that, to what Vijit said, right today, um, you know, in the whole digital world, we're talking about you know uh, full stack engineers, we're talking about sh uh, skills, right, um, e shaped skills, and that's where uh, one of the ask of this team and on uh, success factors of this team that they were able to move from a T-shaped skills to E-shaped skills, right? Where in the power of T-shape, you're looking at large function, I mean, uh, looking at siloed functional skills, 
right? And you know, and with um, te uh, silo technology skills, right? That's where we kind of broadened it out, um, making sure that not they have broad functional skills, right? From understanding the business domain, um, understanding different stakeholders, understanding the value stream mapping, right? Making sure that you know you understand what's value adding, what's not value adding from an end customer standpoint. Bring that customer centricity as a part of thinking. Right? Those are some of the broad skills. And then from an engineering standpoint, um, this particular engagement was basically on cloud, right? And that's where this whole particular uh, you know, team, and that's where learning about the cloud native services, learning about the whole tooling aspect, the software engineering, and learning about learning and building uh, about the automation piece was also a core part of this team, right? And that's where uh, when we just talked about that, you know, today it's not just about um, you know, silo teams, right? It's not just about uh, team members. It's also about end-to-end -end full stack team engineers. And it's important, why I say it's important is when you talk about, and I'm going back, right? When you talk about smaller spots, you're probably looking at teams which are really are able to do multiple of these things as full stack engineers, right? So that's why um, initially uh, this particular team did start with, you know, a lot more silo teams, right? But the end goal was to reach, you know, e-shape skills so that it really helps the um, whole movement around dojo in a more successful manner. Right? Now, having said that, doing all this after a couple of dojos, right? I'm you know, uh, really looking at what did the team achieve. Yeah, and for me, honestly, um, this particular team it was more about you know uh, from doing agile to being agile. Right? Doing agile, yes, absolutely. Uh, they were running those scrum teams. Uh, they're running the uh, the two three week sprints, right? But really, were they being agile? Uh, probably not. Right? And that's where the dojo, uh, um, you know, ways of working really made that uh, fundamental cultural change within the, not just within the team, but also from a for, um, you know business standpoint as well, right? Um, and these are some of the outcomes you know you'd see. But I mean, honestly, these are uh, for me, honestly, these outcomes are more um, you know. It, it had to happen, right? That's what I say, right? If you are being agile, you'll definitely have a high velocity compared to other teams. You'll definitely, you know, have ability to uh, predictability in green, right? Uh, your CSAT scores are going to go down. You are going able to deliver what the business really wants, right? In terms of business KPI, all your, um, the work which you do, uh, you know, will be aligned to, okay, how is, how am I helping the business have better revenue or have better, you know, customer experience or reduce their cycle times and all this. All those aspects are kind of covered as a part of the, uh, you know, outcomes for this particular team. Now, while this is, you might think, you know, uh, hey, this is great, but, you know, can this really be scaled up? Now, based on our past experiences of working uh, with uh, dojos, with the teams, we kind of looked at, this, it's a scalable model. It's not that it's a you know a model which is just um, mapped to a particular team or a particular you know engagement. It's a scalable model, and that's why if you look at it, we are seeing this as in delivery, dojo delivery, and this is where not just leveraging Scrum but also now looking at scaling that as a part of your scaled frameworks like Safe or Less or some of these frameworks. Right? We're also seeing, we're surprised when some of the delivery teams came back saying that okay, they've applied Dojo as a part, Dojo concepts as a part of learning, um, making sure that you know they are uh, working from T-shape to E-shape, right? They've also applied Dojo in some problem solving areas, right? They had a big problem and they really wanted to solve Dojo. So they kind of applied the Dojo concept as a part of you know solving, uh, problem solving. Um, the one which really surprised me was on the automation piece, right? And because the reason why it surprised me is um, a lot of complexities around automation, uh, talk about all AI based automation and all that stuff, right? And that's where I've got a couple of teams which have actually implemented Dojo in, in, in really applying, um, you know, uh, A, building those uh, assets and then, um, you know, in, uh, and then deploying those assets in the team, right? So, all in all, I think it's not just According to me, Dojo is here to stay, right? And just making sure that you know it is not just you know um, for a particular team, but can be expanded um, across the various teams and across the various work we do. Right? Um, and you know, just to sum it up, Dojo is not about. While a lot of people, when they see, when they think about Dojo and they read about Dojo, they think it's all about two and a half days of hyper sprints, hyper sprints, right? But according to me, Dojo is all about a framework which will help you to discover those impediments which are hampering your productivity, uh, hampering your efficiencies, and then busting them at hyperspeed, 
right? Making that visible for everybody, um, those impediments and helping teams to from being agile to being agile. With that, I'll um, pause here um, and see if there are any questions uh, for the uh, from the audience. Um, thanks again, Jess and Vijay. That was a wonderful learning experience and you know, good to know about your experiences. I am sure everybody will take greater value from this. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Devish, for having us here and you know, thanks audience. Thank yeah. you. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks a lot, folks.